Welcome everyone to the Inside the Box lecture series. Tonight is our annual adaptive reuse talk. And it's kind of special for me anyway. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Paul Bentel. Paul is one of my two partners at Bentel and Bentel Architects Planners, and admittedly, my partner in life. Paul received his undergraduate degree in visual arts at Harvard University. Prior to receiving his graduate degree in architecture at Harvard University, where he was co-editor of the Harvard Ar Architectural Review uh, number four, he was a sculptor in Pietrasanta, Italy. He received his PhD from the HTC program, the History Theory Criticism of Architecture program at MIT. He has taught at Harvard, MIT, the Federal Polytechnic University in Zurich, and is a professor of architecture and history at Columbia University. He has taught for over 30 years in the preservation department. He has delivered lectures at Harvard, MIT, Yale, the Rhode Island School of Design, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and in Zurich at the ETH. He is a licensed architect. He is a fellow in the AA. AIA College of Fellows, and is the co-author of two books with a focus on Bentel and Bentel, uh, the firm's work. The title of his talk is Ex Nihilo Nihil, Nothing Comes from Nothing. So welcome, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Carol. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Er yes? Okay. Uh, Good evening, everybody. I, uh, I'm. Let me. Uh, the, first of all, delighted to be here. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to be a participant in your uh, lecture program. Uh, I'm going to be talking about adaptive reuse, uh, not necessarily of historic structures, although that is certainly part of what we think of as older buildings. So this is the the reuse of older buildings for new uses. But specifically, the 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 role that design plays in not simply uh, occupying an old building with a new use, but transforming the building in the process, turning it into an entirely new entity, which merges the new and the old into one thing. And the idea of nothing coming from nothing is to say that something comes from something, and therefore. Uh, the the role of the pre-existing building is to provide a substantial platform for the new uh, structure. So let me start with some images to sort of get us into the subject here. So you need to, sh there you go. Are you seeing my? Yes, yeah, we see, my... yes. Okay. Uh, so nothing comes from nothing. Ex nihil, nihil, transformation as an expressive design methodology and adaptive reuse. So emphasis here on the idea of transformation, taking something from one form and through a design process to transform it, change it into something, uh, something new. Uh, now, in the early 2000s, uh, it became quite popular to think about uh, the role that old buildings played in helping us uh, deal with uh, climate change, for example. And it became quite fashionable to say that the greenest building is one that is already built. This was an argument for preserving or conserving existing buildings, not only because they have historical value and they're in many cases quite beautiful, but also because they, they possess embodied energy, which is to say that merely in the fact of their materials and in the energy that it took to create the building, they represent a repository of energy, which if the building is destroyed will disappear. So rather than making the building disappear, why don't we try to capture that energy in a new structure? Uh, the problem is that old buildings are very inefficient in energy com com uh, consumption. They frequently don't accommodate our contemporary needs in terms of the, the way that we circulate within them. Uh, they are frequently uh, very poorly structured 
uh, in some cases prone to collapse because of uh, earthquakes. Uh, and so it becomes essential for us to think about in the process of reusing old buildings, the necessity also of uh, changing them in ways that makes them uh, appropriate for contemporary use. Uh, this opens up a design opportunity to both capture the embodied energy of the older building, but also to capture some of the special features of, that, of those older buildings, their, their material qualities, their communal value, the, the, the fact that these buildings have been standing in a particular place for a long period of time means that they have acquired a certain uh, persona within the context of a community, and that's also of value. Uh, those values are things that our new use of those buildings uh, should be coming to the fore. So the opportunity that we're talking about is one in which we have program requirements. We want to in, uh, in, improve the envelope in terms of making it more efficient, uh, improve the energy performance of the mechanical systems, make the buildings accessible, uh, try to retain existing fabric in order to maintain that embodied energy. On, on the opportunity side, what this allows us to do is to begin to think about those materials as design features to begin to think about the way in which the new structure will not merely inhabit the old one, but transform the old and the new into an entirely new formal whole. Uh, to create new style idioms that work not just with contemporary architecture or with older architecture, but draw on both of those uh, idioms of design and also to create a narrative of design to understand in, in, in very pragmatic terms what the nature of that transformation is. In our work, we deal a lot with uh, metaphors as a way of understanding that process, a way of trying to translate to ourselves and to other people what it is that we think we're doing when we approach design in a particular way. Uh, and so tonight, what I wanted to do was to talk about eight metaphors that describe for us some of the methods of making something new from something old. So we're gonna be looking at this group, absorbing, unmasking, embedding, mimicking, construing, overlaying, camouflaging, and weaving. That's a lot of gerunds, but that's the focus of the talk this evening. And we'll be using primarily work uh, that we have carried out over the last 10 or 15 years. I should point out that we're going to be focusing on the uh, architectural and design features of these buildings, but it, it goes without saying that in each and every case, this reuse was accompanied by a, a significant improvement in uh, thermal insulation, mechanical systems, circulation, light and air, uh, structural integrity, et cetera. So the first category is absorbing. This is to say to take something in in a natural and gradual way and to transform it by, by essentially incorporating it into a larger whole, the way that water might enter a sponge, for example. So the example of this is an interesting building that we did in New England. This is uh, just adjacent to MIT, uh, a part of the world that was an industrial zone, uh, but which has been completely transformed because of the proximity to MIT into a major research and um, bio, specifically in biotechnology, research and uh, production center for uh, uh, new forms of, uh, of medical uh, medicines, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Moderna, for example, which you may know from uh, our, uh, our experiences through COVID is headquartered here. And what has happened is that uh, the, the area has grown substantially. These are lab, the, what you see here on either side. I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, these are laboratory buildings, very interesting building typology because the floor heights are very high because of all that ductwork that you frequently see inside of a laboratory space. And so these buildings become behemoths. Now, the one building that was retained was this small structure here, which was of all things, a maple sugar factory. Um, it distributed, it's collected maple syrup or maple sap, 
and transformed it into syrup and was sold throughout New, New England. A relatively prominent building in its day, but in the context of this environment, <laughs> rather petite. Uh, the building was, was uh, called historic by the local municipality and the developers of the building around it were compelled to maintain this building. Uh, we felt a little sorry for the building. It's pretty small. So, uh, and here you can see, this is a, a little hard to read, but this is a solar uh, angle study going from morning to midday to late afternoon to night. And you'll see that the building is in shadow almost all of the day. And here, here it is in the context of these larger buildings around it. So our first instinct was to say, you know, we can do a lot of things with this building, but we want to aggrandize it. We want to create something new, which incorporates it into its into a structure, making it a part of that structure, um, but also creating an entirely new uh, identity for both the new and the existing. So in this stra so here's the building seen from above. Uh, you can see the original structure here. It's essentially a brick building with a series of bays articulated by windows. Uh, our first strategy was to carry the rhythm of the structural bay into the new structure, which you can see here. So this rhythm continues all the way through the building. There are important uh, transformations, however, as well. Whereas the original building was a, a, let us call it a canvas with a series of openings, holes, the windows. Uh, when we transformed this building in the new idiom, the columns now, those parts that were part of the wall, become the figural element, the piece that stands out. And that is what marks the cadence of the structure through the new and old. We also added to the top of the building, and you can see here, creating uh, a, a zone for all of the new uh, mechanical equipment. Uh, and here in section, you can see the relationship between the new building, which essentially overlaps the old building, but carries the floor plates through. So here, uh, the original building, a heavy timber and masonry construction, and the new building, a reinforced concrete uh, structure, which essentially enveloped it. Now, the strategy was to allow this building to have a presence in relationship to portions of the new building, but also to frame both the new and the existing uh, with uh, very strong prominent elements that operate as linear features and also as planar elements. And we'll look at that in a minute. You can see here in plan, the relationship of the new and the existing, uh, which is articulated by that slight offset between the two connected by the circulation core, which you can see here, which runs up and essentially connects the two buildings, creating that accessibility uh, that I was uh, that I was talking about. And then an interior view of a location where the new constructional system actually starts to weave its way into the existing building. And in areas where the new building presents itself, it's really all metal and glass. So here a view of all of the elevations where this uh, realization of the pre-existing building in the context of the new becomes entirely self-evident. That view from the side with the framing element of the roof and the wall carried out also on the front of the building here so that that framing element is now framing the essentially the new portion on the rear of, so this view is from the street here. This view is from the back here where the, the existing building reappears. Uh, with that framing element. And then on the opposite side here where we have created a zone due to the offset of the new addition for circulation primarily here, this, this peekaboo area where the existing building now is framed by uh, the new structure. Uh, the building is designed to be seen in three dimensions because most of the views of this will be from the street, but also from the upper levels of the adjacent building. And so uh, this was very much a response to the context, but also a response to our perceptions of how this building would fit into that context. And here are some other views just to give you a sense of uh, the experience of the building from, uh, from the street and in relationship to uh, buildings around it from the major street uh, and then from what essentially is the rear and the public plaza that's formed by uh, the space between this building and its adjoining laboratory structure. 
other views, as I mentioned, uh, that view from above, which gives the building a presence, even when seen from these larger buildings around it, and just as a reference back to the original building, which you can see here. So in this scenario, the building, the original building is essentially drawn into a larger corpus or body that is defined by essential features that frame and articulate uh, the perimeter of the, of the new building. Unmasking is another strategy where you you enter into the pre-existing building and start pulling things away to make it clear uh, what it consists of. And for this, uh, we turn to a project that we did uh, some time ago, a restaurant, which is located in, oops, this is located inside uh, this uh, uh, former, uh, essentially, uh, department store in the Ladies Mile Historic District in New York City. These buildings have a particular characteristic, which is the upper floors were for production and the lower floors were essentially sales areas, uh, which is the reason for the large plate glass windows. Uh, they were also fireproof construction. So when we were uh, introduced to the project, the first thing we started to do was to think about some aspect of the pre-existing building on its interior that had a material quality that we could reveal and expose to uh, guests. So this is the unmasking process where you begin to see the original uh, concrete columns clad in the terracotta fireproofing or the original brick wall that is the party wall between structures. Each of these framed, articulated, celebrated, monumentalized, either by the framing uh, architecturally or by significant lighting. Uh, the columns now march through the space as really very powerful reminders of the building around and above you within the space. And the new building, the new structure, the new interior is purposefully also vigorously material because of the desire to create a, 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 a conversation between the pre-existing uh, and the new in raw metals, bronze, uh, black and steel, leather, for example, uh, wood primarily, uh, cherry and uh, mahogany. These are materials that are incorporated into the design in ways that allow you to see their material characteristics, their color, their texture, their warmth uh, in relationship to the material palette of the original. And so uh, I can't say that it's seamless, but a very integrated connection between new and old through this unmasking process as the first step. Here are some details. The, the brick wall, as I mentioned, framed now by the new architectural elements to become almost a piece of art within the space, uh, adjacent to the new leather wall articulated to create the same kind of texture, pattern, uh, rhythm that you see in the brick itself. Another example of this uh, is an interior of a beautiful church uh, on Long Island, where we were called upon to renovate the interior. This is a, uh, a, a it's a neo-Gothic building designed in the early years of the 20th century by a famous architect trained in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. It's a beautiful building, uh, the, the fabric of which is the uh, Man Manhattan schist that was excavated at the same time the building was being built for the New York City subway system. So this stone, which actually appears in great quantities in this neighborhood, uh, has a history in itself. Now the interior was entirely clad in plaster and then was uh, covered in frescoes, which over time had been lost to the point where they were irrecoverable. So in order to produce bring back some of that richness of the original interior, we painted most of the stucco surfaces white, but stripped some of it away to reveal the interior face of the exterior wall so that the reality of that stone is transmitted to the interior. You can see it here throughout the perimeter and on this very powerful. One thing we recognized was that by introducing this dark exterior, we also managed to really highlight the pre-existing stained glass windows. And again, this was this whole process was done in the context of significant mechanical upgrades and insulation upgrades, et cetera, and protection of the of the stained glass, new lighting, et cetera. 
uh, I won't go into the uh, long and drawn out description of how the altar and baptismal font and uh, and pulpit were reconstituted in the new design, but that also became an exercise in dismantling and then reassembling features of the pre-existing building. Another um, fascinating uh, strategy uh, is to embed something new within the context of something uh, of something old. Uh, in this particular case, we were asked to introduce a new program element, a small cafe into this larger reinforced concrete building designed by Marcel Breuer in the 1960s for the Yale uh, engineering department. Uh, it's a beautiful yeah. building, highly textural, very materially ro uh, um, robust. We would call this an example of brutalist architecture. And they wanted us to introduce this petite, rather well-behaved cafe into the midst of this, of this structure. So in this particular case, in, in terms of embedding, we thought of this as embedding a little jewel uh, very colorful, very rich materially, uh, very um, a broad range of, of material, not only in terms of texture, but also in terms of color and in terms of treatment into the midst of this. And uh, because this is the School of Engineering and the School of Engineering has a, a relationship with Philips and Philips makes televisions, we were also able to introduce this extremely large video screen which is essentially uh, a canvas for student exercises in digital uh, graphic arts so that you can sit in the cafe with your laptop and launch your most recent animation on the screen behind you. So this thing is constantly changing and you can see it here. So it's the, the, the cafe is here. So this little tiny space is visible uh, from the street. Now, there are other features of the architecture that are important about this. Embedding uh, did not mean that we were putting something entirely foreign or alien into this context in the same way that the original building has this robust, articulated, rhythmic, patterned characteristic in terms of the fenestration, for example. Uh, we also used the new material palette to bring some relationship uh, to the, between the, let us call it the ornamental vocabulary of new and old, and in the process also revealed uh, existing concrete formwork of the original building. So what you see here is a new walnut screen overlapping and illuminated from below in a way that articulates the pre-existing highly textured concrete surface behind. And this is one of those great things that happens in the context of adaptive reuse where you discover features of the original building that now you embrace and bring to the forefront. Again, a kind of transformation, taking something old and making it into something new without losing the original character. Uh, and then of course, this relationship of the, of the light and the animation to, to this structure as a, as a kind of balancing act with the robust, relatively static, monolithic character of the original building. Uh, I, I hope that Marcel Breuer would be very happy when he saw this little piece. Mimicking is another very uh, important uh, category of relationships between new and old, where you, you, you look hard at the original and think about uh, ways in which you can subtly and perhaps not so subtly imitate the original. So here, a Carnegie Library uh, uh, located in a suburban environment. Uh, you may not be familiar with Carnegie Libraries. The, the uh, uh, steel uh, magnate, Andrew Carnegie, uh, gave a significant, endowed a, uh, um, a, a, a foundation whose principal role was to fund the construction of libraries throughout the country. And that allowed uh, for a whole generation from the late 19th to the early 20th century, a whole generation of architects and librarians to think about and create really novel structures serving the public in a civic way, both examples of 
places for civic engagement and also for learning. And they were decorated in a very powerful uh, neoclassical style, frequently also combining new technologies like uh, the, the window systems. These are all, this is a reinforced uh, steel frame building uh, to allow light, natural light to enter into the building in, in particular, uh, particularly important program areas. You may know that one of the central features of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts as a teaching uh, pedagogy was to think hard about the way that program informs form and shape. Uh, and in this case, the form of the fan vault and the Palladian window relates to the function of the interior space as a reading space. So we borrowed this in the new structure, which was uh, a, a low rise single story building uh, and populated the roof with elements that recall the original structure and function in a similar way, allowing light, you can see it here, and there's another structure back here, allowing light into the areas of the new building that become the reading uh, spaces. We also incorporated elements of the existing buildings, such as the limestone striations, the color of the brick, to draw the, 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 the character of the exterior of this building, which is so powerful as a, as a stylistic feature into uh, the new building. And of course, also introducing in, in the process new circulation and uh, for accessibility, uh, that would now solve the problem for moving between both buildings and also getting to all the floors in the uh, pre-existing building. Uh, construing, now this is perhaps the most abstract of those uh, forms that I'm going to be talking about. To construe is to try to understand and interpret and explain the sense of intention of someone or something, and then to respect and bring those ideas into your new structure. And in this case, we have this uh, very simple uh, agricultural building set in an agricultural landscape. Uh, this is a very powerful uh, feature of this building, not just what it did. This was a hayloft, essentially. Uh, which is why the upper portions of the building have this uh, open structure of um, tile to create the possibility for air to flow through. Uh, the lower level was a stall for animals, but also the way that this building relates to other structures within the landscape uh, is very important. There's a culture here that's expressive in the way these buildings all connect and also the open space in between, which was that agricultural landscape itself. So recognizing the significance of that relationship, our efforts were to try to uh, extract that and then reinterpret it into a building which would now be repurposed as a residential structure. So we uh, basically, uh, in this case, had to take the building apart because it this is unreinforced masonry. So the first time the wind blows the wrong way, this whole thing could collapse. We rebuilt the structure and then reclad it with the existing original material to create essentially a copy of the original building. And in the process, we introduced uh, a new mechanical system. This building is insulated <laughs> extraordinarily well. Uh, so we have basically created an entirely new structure, extracting and retaining through construing the image of this building within the landscape in which it sits. Now, we also were able to double the size of the building. And in doing that, picked up some of the vocabulary of the pre-existing. So this is the pre-existing building. This is the new building. So we picked up on the vocabulary of the stone walls, creating two stone walls that wrapped the interior structure and then two glass walls which were the only walls of the existing of the new structure that touched the existing so here you can see the existing structure and here you can see those two glass walls touching the original the roof form uh, carried from one building to the next so we also retain that so here you have uh, the building as it's seen the new and the pre-existing uh, the roof form here, uh, a conventional pitched roof, and then on the adjoining structure, a butterfly roof that carries the same pitches through. And then, of course, the glass making its gentle touch on the existing building. Uh, 
and then of course on the on the interior the opportunity to work with some of the beautiful spaces uh, i love to tell the story that this was once the hayloft where untold numbers of young italians used to hang out smooching and now it's the bedroom for the uh, owners of this property um <laughs> overlaying uh to superimpose new things on pre-existing uh another strategy uh uh, which we find to be very uh, valuable conceptually. And in this case, uh, I'm taking the example of the restaurant at the Museum of Modern Art, where we were asked to insert a restaurant into the area that had previously been, from the very first moment the, the, the museum opened, the lobby of the museum. Now, you all know that the Museum of Modern Art has grown tremendously. Uh, you can see it here. The foot. This is the original uh, footprint of the museum, and with subsequent additions, both uh, to the west and the east, has grown significantly. Our restaurant is located here, and so we sought to maintain <laughs> some of the critical features of the original structure. Here is the original structure. This was the original entrance. So we're here. Subsequently, there was an addition built here by uh, designed by Philip Johnson. Our entrance from the street and entrance from the museum would occur around the original entrance, this beautiful curvilinear form. Uh, and so we picked up on the vocabulary of these curves. You can see this here in the original building and here in our entrance motif, but also here through portions of the of the restaurant and plan. And then we also maintained the original column structure, which are evident on the interior of the building. Here, you can see these, these were, have always been there uh, and we reclad them to create a, a, a strong focus for them. We also, uh, in this particular case, took the opportunity to go and look at other works by the same architect. This is, uh, this is a house that uh, Ed, Edward Durrell Stone, the architect for the museum, designed for the museum director around the same time that the museum itself was being built. So we spent some time here. By the way, fortuitously, this building was also in the process of being adaptively reused or improved as a residence. But there are features there that we were greatly inspired by, such as the almost nautical motif of the circular pattern, uh, the incorporation of artwork, at very large scale. And so here you can see that reiterated here in the entrance from the museum, the gate uh, into the between the restaurant and the museum uh, picks up on that theme of the circle. It's also repeated in the punts of the bottles in the wine rack, which you see here, and the incorporation of artwork uh, as a defining moment of entrance or a significant uh, entrance moment. Uh, other aspects of this that we found to be really inspiring was the use of artwork as not as decoration, but we say art to situate, not to decorate. This is the major piece inside uh, the, the restaurant, which gives us a place and time and again, layered into the space, uh, but also taking cues from other buildings by uh, designs by the architect of the original. Uh, I have two more camouflage. Uh, you know, this is where you start to incorporate uh, design features, which almost entirely restructure the interior to an extent that you can't really tell what's new and what's old. This is a restaurant that we did uh, up in Boston. It was uh, an insertion into the conductor's building with a rather ge weird geometry. It's a long, skinny building with clipped ends because the trolleys would make their turn here in Cambridge as they returned back into the city of Boston. A uh, beautiful building, entirely gutted on its interior. So we took the opportunity to introduce a palette of dark metal, wood, brick, and masonry, uh, and incorporate that in an environment with the original brick, the, some of the new mechanical systems, features of the existing structure, so that, again, almost impossible to tell where new and uh, existing uh, begin and end, and yet the end is a very synthetic whole character. And then uh, uh, finally, weaving new into old, almost like uh, as you would in a, a sweater weave 
uh, new elements into the fabric of an of uh, an existing building, and we use this uh, uh, in significantly in a structure a similar agricultural building where we were asked to reinforce uh, this porch, and we did it not by concealing those elements, but actually by revealing it, creating a, a superstructure inside, and beginning to incorporate very subtle elements such as the strapping that connects the steel frame, which you can see here, to the columns on the exterior, thus reinforcing both the structure and these uh, columns, which again are unreinforced uh, masonry. They they rely on on goodwill and uh, lots of prayers to stand up, and and hopefully we've uh, allowed this building to to persist over time. And the detailing of that uh, is really um, you know quite extraordinary. A lot of this, by the way. Uh, is a product of working with craftspeople who have an understanding for the, the character of this relationship between new and old. This is a particularly interesting joint. Uh, the major timber structure runs through here. This had to be a joint between steel members that have a moment connection, that is to say they can resist twisting. Uh, there was not enough dimension above the beam to create a significant joint between those two sections of the of the beam and so we came up with a detail that allowed us to bridge below the wood beam preserving the wood beam and in the process also creating a kind of articulation which is really uh, beautiful in itself in the way that it uh, uh, articulates expresses uh, both the idea of what's new and what's old, but also allows the old to simply uh, slide through. And you can see similar kinds of interweaving throughout. And that, excuse me, I believe is 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 the end. Uh, I, 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 I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, this, uh, we can talk a little bit about strategies. The one point I wanted to make was um, the idea that design is driven by a narrative, uh, which I believe my teaching colleague, Carol Rushi would Bentel would probably call a party, uh, is an extremely important compass that gives you, maintains your direction throughout the process. Now you may change your party, you may change the metaphors that you're working with, you may acquire new metaphors that describe the strategies that you're engaging, but the ability to articulate an idea that becomes the the sort of gravitational center or the North Pole, the North Star for your work uh, is an extremely important aspect of design to ensure that the design continues with a singular focus and at the end of the day expresses itself with a wholeness. So the transforming is about forming. It's about making a form. It's about creating an identity for something uh, that you've created. So, Carol, uh, thank wow. you. Th thank you very much. I think this uh, is an important lecture, not just for all of our students, but I'm thinking about our seniors who are in the midst of their research for their thesis, and they've all had to pick an existing structure. And now you have very nicely given them eight vocabulary words to think about how they might treat the structures that they've selected. So I think this is just terrific. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm giving applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to open it up to our students for some questions. <laughs>